Welcome everyone to BizHack Live Digital Marketing Masterclass Series Season 6, uh, the culminating season of a year of amazing programming and with hopes uh, that this is just the beginning of our work together with Strive 305 and we have big plans we hope to be able to announce soon uh, about that. Uh, my name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy and your host for a four-part series exploring the metaverse and metaverse marketing, um, the metaverse and metaverse and Web3 for businesses. Today, we're gonna focus on metaverse marketing, how brands are rewriting the rules of marketing in the metaverse. We have three amazing guests, Chessie, Jay, and Jackie. Next week at this time on Wednesday, 9.14 at 12.30, we're gonna be talking about the financial and legal implications of Web3 for business. Listen, we're not assuming any knowledge. So if you're like, what is metaverse? What is Web3? Don't worry. Uh, Brett's going to give us some easy to understand definitions of these terms so that we all start in the same spot. We're looking to be as inclusive as possible. I did also want to alert you to the Q&A below uh, in your Zoom. If you have any questions now or at any point during the presentation, put those in the Q&A box and I will be folding them in to our live Q&A session with our guests. So it's just the Q&A button and you can go ahead and ask a question in there. Uh, please don't put questions in the chat, they're gonna get lost. In two weeks from today on 921, we're gonna now turn to internal communications, how to engage employees and recruit talent using the metaverse. Brett is gonna be one of our featured guests from Starmark for the amazing work they're doing in using uh, the metaverse for town hall meetings and employee engagement. And then Angela Anthony, uh, uh, Anthony from Scoutable is gonna talk about how it's being used for education and recruiting. And then finally uh, on 928, uh, we're gonna be featuring case studies in how to do business using Web3 in the metaverse with Dr. Musina Morris from Morehouse College. Two years ago, she built an entire virtual campus for Morehouse College in the metaverse. It's just an extraordinary story. So buckle up and stay tuned for the, these great four sessions. We're so proud. We've been working months to put these together for you. The simple goal of these is to provide you non-hyped, real-life information about the next great technological revolution, which is what we call Web3 and the metaverse. So Web1 was the internet websites. Web 2 was social media dominated by Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. Web 3 is the emerging technology built on the blockchain and that utilizes uh, important tools like the metaverse. We're going to explain to you what those are and the kind of business activities that are happening today in those spaces. And at the end of this, as a gift for coming, we're going to give you a set of best practices culled from all of our guests over the four sessions of how you can get started in Web3 and the metaverse right away. I'm gonna be the host for this journey together. My name is Dan Gretsch. I have a background in journalism. I was a, for 15 years, a correspondent on NPR, PBS. Uh, I worked also at the Washington Post and the Miami Herald and I was the news director at WLRN. I actually created Miami's first podcast, Under the Sun, long before we even had a name for them. Uh, it was a weekly series that we would put uh, online and on air. And since 2013, I've really transitioned from being a journalistic storyteller into a business storyteller, heading up digital marketing for a large company, two software startups, and then starting my own digital marketing training and consulting business, which is BizHack. Uh, went to Princeton as an undergrad. I'm a proud Panther, got my master's degree there, and I also was a Fulbright scholar. I wanna introduce my partner in crime for producing this series, our subject matter expert, Brett Searcy, a digi Chief Digital Officer of Starmark. And Brett, did you wanna just say a word about your background and what brought you here today? Uh, sure. I mean, I love technology. So, um, you know, it's been in my blood for a long time. I built my first commerce website in 1995. I've um, spun off and uh, was the president of several technology companies. I have patents uh, that I've gotten on uh, technology products. I manage the innovation lab here at Starmark. 
and um, we get to play with all the cool new technology in the lab. And not all of those things have uh, real practical applications, but when they when they do, um, it's always exciting to bring those to our clients and to say, here's how this new uh, innovative technology can work uh, on your behalf and help you meet your goals. And so, um, you know, for the last uh, few years, it's been augmented reality. And then really in about the last couple of years since the, the Quest 2 um, came out, it's virtual reality is really, it's really made it accessible to everybody, really kind of made it take off. And so um, excited to be here. And, you know, Brett is an incredibly modest, he, he runs uh, and was one of the founders of Starmark, perhaps one of the most uh, storied and best known uh, digital agency, uh, always in South Florida, always on the cutting edge. He's an incredible uh, designer and, and programmer and partner and really is very much responsible for the excellence that you're going to see today in terms of our amazing guests. I also did want to say that, um, you know, I am not pretending to be an expert in this field. In many ways, I represent you, the business owner who's confused and curious. And so I'm going to be using that as, a, as my tool to help you guys to be a translator for you of what can get very hyped and very complex. And, and one thing I do wanna promise is I am gonna approach this as a journalist, right? Which is where my background is. And as a journalist, I think so much of this stuff is like a ledger of checks that will never be cashed, right? Promises that will never be kept. And so part of what I'm always gonna be doing with Chessie and Jay today and with other guests coming up is saying, Okay, that sounds great. You know, I I am reading Snow Crash. You know, the originator <laughs> of the uh, of the idea of the metaverse by Neil Stevenson back in the early '90s. This is this was originated in this book, and I'm about halfway through it and loving it. And it's incredible how prescient he was. But there's so much of this that is really TBD, and so we're going to try to determine like what's what's today, what's tomorrow, and what's hype and try to give you guys a little bit of a clear picture of that. I want to introduce uh, and welcome to, to the stage our amazing partner, Danilo Vargas, from the Diversity Inclusion Office uh, of Miami-Dade County, uh, the Office of the Mayor of Miami-Dade County. Danilo is the creator and the lead leader of the Miami-Dade County Strive 305 initiative. Uh, Danilo, welcome and thank you to you and the Mayor's Office for supporting this, for funding this, for making this possible. Oh, thank you so much, Dan. And I just want to say hello to everyone. My name is Danilo Vargas, and I'm the Small Business Innovation Manager for Mayor Daniela Levine Cava. And, you know, I, I have the great honor and pleasure of leading the Mayor's Strive 305 Small Business Initiative. And in fact, um, the goal of Strive 305 is really just to help you have access to the services and the support that you need to grow. Uh, in other words, to help you make more money, right? And uh, actually it's money season at Miami-Dade County because we are right in the middle of budget hearings. And so I wanna invite anybody here who uh, appreciates what we're doing here through Strike 305, through these master classes. Um, I invite you, today we have a converse, budget conversation with Mayor Cava at the South Dade Regional Library in South Dade. And then we're gonna have one next week uh, at Miami Lakes uh, as well. And I invite everybody uh, to be engaged with our county government and participate you can go to tomorrow's budget hearing at the Stephen P. Clark Center uh, tomorrow, uh, starting at five. And so today we meet with um, with the mayor at six p.m. It's your chance to to get to know her, uh, shake her hand, and ask her any questions that you have. Uh, bring your tough questions; she doesn't shy away from those. And uh, I just want to say also that I'm super excited about this class, Dan, because uh, the mayor's office and BizHack have been working on this new season six for months. And so I'm really excited. It's time to forget the hype and get real about what Web 3.0 uh, 3 or 3 um, and the metaverse really mean for small business owners. Because just like in the 1990s when the World Wide Web was born, there's a sea change happening. And those who understand it and learn how to use these new technologies are going to have a competitive edge. So that's what season six is all about for me. And I want to congratulate everybody for joining us. Please take some good notes and uh, just get ready to learn a ton about the brand new world of Web3. So thank you, Dan, back to you. Absolutely. And I wanna welcome our guests, uh, our partners who helped us promote this in the community. Uh, it's really a who's who of chambers of commerce and small business 
and minority and, and BIPOC owned and women owned business support organizations. And we're, we're so grateful to you guys for helping spread the word and bringing the nearly 100 people who are here today uh, in, front, uh, in front of us. We've actually had more than 1,800 people attend one of our six seasons of masterclass sessions, um, and we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you to our promotional partners. If anyone here on the call today is an organization that supports small businesses, uh, BIPOC-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, LinkedIn, uh, we would love to throw your logo on here. Please <laughs> let me know, you can reach out to me. Um, and um, Tiffany, if you could put my email uh, and contact information, you guys, we're always looking, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible, as community oriented as possible. And this is really, at least for South Florida, who's who of uh, business support organizations. All right, without further ado, I wanna welcome our two expert. Uh, we have three guests today. One of them is a super special surprise and none of you would uh, know about. Uh, so we'll start with the two panelists for, uh, or the two guests for today's conversation. I'm going to be conducting this a little bit like a radio show, given that my background. And so this is going to be more uh, of a conversation rather than your typical panel discussion. Uh, the first is, is the amazing Francesca Chessy de Casada Covey. Uh, she is a partner at the Venture City and a tech innovation advisor at Miami-Dade County. Her specialization is investing in early stage companies uh, and becoming an extension of their team by providing strategic growth insights and capital. One of the companies that she invested in which is one of the first things I'd like to hear about, is a metaverse marketing company. And so we're really excited for you to share us a little bit about that. You're the tech and innovation advisor to the mayor, uh, which is how we learned about you. Thank you, Danilo. And before joining the Venture City, you worked at Facebook, now known as Meta, to drive cross-Facebook company strategy development and to build scaled uh, development teams supporting internet.org, SMB Commerce, and crypto efforts, Novi and DM. So really what Francesca represents for us today is someone who is intimately in touch with some of the most innovative startups in this space and has a long history of being uh, on the cutting edge of the highest levels of technology. Uh, we're so honored to have you here, Chessie. I also wanted to welcome uh, Jay Miola from The Cuttlefish. They are a, a firm that's been on the forefront, forefront of immersive tech for 15 years, inventing and launching bleeding edge digital experiences for major brands. And one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is how major brands are using this in their marketing. And we've brought up a bunch of really fun examples that Brett will take us through um, and, and that Jay will, ex will, ex will use. The, the metaverse is not like a theoretical construct. It, it's no longer uh, something from a book. It's actually happening today with actual firms in a variety of ways to support products and services and experiences. And so Jay is going to give us some of the um, kind of uh, dispatches from the frontier uh, of what's possible in the metaverse. And we're so excited to have you here. And then finally, here's our big special surprise, Jackie. <laughs> Uh, Jones from uh, LinkedIn, Head of Strategic Partnerships, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. I love that word belonging. I'll definitely want to ask you more about that. You know, we are at BizHack trying to create a space that is inclusive, and uh, we're so lucky uh, to partner with the mayor's office who's dedicated to the same thing. And, you know, Jackie is one of Brett's clients. Brett uh, brought Jackie to the table, and, and Jackie is going to spend a Q&A session at the end of our um, session today, a kind of little bonus. Uh, so if you're able to stick around till 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, when we wrap up the regular session, we'll bring Jackie to have her talk about how she's unlocking economic opportunities for diverse groups through thought leadership partnerships and new product offerings at LinkedIn. Thank you so much, Jackie, for being here today. One uh, more thing, people always ask us, can we get a copy of this recording? The good news is yes. Uh, either the BizHack or the Starmark YouTube channels will be within the next day or two posting a link to this very recording. Um, and that will be the pattern. After each of the sessions, you'll get a link to the recording. By virtue of you signing up today, you will get a follow-up email from us with the link to our YouTube channels, uh, inviting you to, to watch the recordings and share those. 
At the end of the session, um, we're going to co compile all the insights from all the guests into a summary of key takeaways, and we'll be sending that to you uh, as a thank you for showing up today at the end of the session. You're also automatically enrolled in the three subsequent master classes, so nothing else you need to do except mark your calendars 1230 on the next three Wednesdays. And if you know someone who would benefit from this, Tiffany, if you could please put this link into there. We are, uh, our goal is to have at least 100 at every one of these. We broke the 100 mark, which was our goal for today. And we wanna give this information to as many people as possible. So if you know anyone who you think would benefit from learning a little bit about Web3 and the metaverse for business, please invite them. Today's webinar is how brands are rewriting the rules of marketing in the metaverse. I wanted to welcome up Brett uh, to talk a little bit about what is the metaverse? What is Web3? What the heck are we talking about? Please ground us in reality. All right, I'll just kind of give you a couple uh, setups for some basic terms, so to speak. But, you know, the metaverse is sort of like the internet. Uh, it, it is um, it, it ultimately going to be a single thing. Does it exist today? I would, you know, probably I would say no, not necessarily. It's so we're still in its infancy. Um, and like the early internet, um, you, you, people uh, like which we would call web 1.0 allowed people to create websites, right? So on the internet, you have websites. In the metaverse, you could have meta worlds, uh, which do exist today. And a lot of meta worlds do exist, but they're not yet interconnected. The cool thing about a website is anybody can link to anybody. You know, the small guy can link to Microsoft and Microsoft can link to someone else and someone else can link back to the small guy. And this interconnectivity makes the internet work, right? When, the, when the, these meta worlds allow people to pass from one to another using their same avatar, their same identity, then these meta worlds are connected and then you'll have the metaverse. Um, and so that's kind of the, the overview of that. Um, there are the meta worlds that exist today are like, you know, Roblox or Fortnite or Minecraft or Horizon Worlds. These are all examples of these of these meta worlds that absolutely exist today. They have millions of people on them, right? Um, a lot of new ones are being spawned, right? And ultimately, there will be a standard that allows this interconnectivity to create the metaverse. And that's that's a very exciting thing. Web3 just defines like the third the third generation of the internet. The, the first generation of the internet was allowing people to build websites. The little guy and the big guy could kind of be on equal playing field when the websites uh, were able to be built. Web two is more about social media and the socialization. So that was the launch and spawn of social platforms, allowing brands to have direct connections with their customers through, through social platforms and people to connect with each other. And then web three is really just saying, what is the next version of the internet gonna take? And, and the, the large take on this is more about ownership. And this is where blockchain technology, which is basically a distributed ledger and NFTs, non-fungible -fung tokens come into play is Web3 is going to allow us or anyone uh, you know, to become more, have some more ownership over ourselves. A lot of people today say, you know, part of the problem with uh, social media is that you know, we're the product, but we don't necessarily own anything about ourselves, right? So Web3 isn't a whole new thing. It's really saying like, we're going to take what some of Web.1 web and Web.2, and we're going to allow some more ownership of yourself in that in Web.3. And we're going to use the blockchain to allow commerce to happen. So that's just some basics about uh, the metaverse and uh, Web3. Clear as mud. That's why we have our experts on the call. <laughs> Exactly. A lot of this is clear as mud. You know, we're going to be, um, it, by the end of this fourth session, you'll have a pretty clear idea of what is the Web3, what is the metaverse, and very concrete examples uh, of how businesses are starting to use it. Um, I'd actually like to, uh, in that spirit, start with you, Chessie. Um, you are, you know, a technologist, uh, you're an investor, you're an advisor. But there is one company that I wanted you to start in telling us about, which is Matt Goulet, the founder of Sturdy, uh, which is one of the companies that you're supporting and investing in. Can you talk a little bit about what Matt Goulet and the Sturdy team are trying to do uh, with metaverse marketing? Absolutely. So, Dan, thanks so much for having me. Brett, it's wonderful to be here. And Danilo, thank you so much. I saw some Danilo um, chat love going by. Danilo. Oh, somebody said Danilo is such a pillar of our community and is um, such a leader of all the great work that's happening here. So Danilo, thank you for having me here and for being such a steward of, of our community and of, of Mayor Levine Cava's administration. Um, so 
as um, Dan, you were saying, my background is from Facebook, um, now called Meta. I left before um, it was called Meta, so I still call it Facebook. Um, and there I started working on Meta's crypto efforts. Um, and one of the things to think about when you think about Web3 and the reason that it's called Web3, it's not called crypto, it's not called blockchain, all of these terms are used interchangeably, is that Web3 takes the principles of user experience from Web2, which Web2, that's what we were able to define. We made it really easy for people to get online, really easy for people to engage with products. And it takes that and it thinks about how to implement those principles of user experience in decentralized ways. So in ways that everyone can own their experience and where there is no central hub making decisions for the content that you see or how you keep your money or how you engage um, with others on platforms. And when we think, when I put on my investor hat and I think about what's most exciting for me about Web3, it's about thinking about how you can create really um, long-term value for users and for companies. And so one of the companies that we invested in, as Dan was saying, is a company called Sturdy Exchange. Sturdy Exchange started as an NFT marketplace. Um, for those that are familiar with NFTs, they're more than just JPEGs that you own. They also give you utility to make sure that you can interact with the world around you. And the best NFT projects have really strong utility use cases, both in the digital world and in, in real life. Um, and so they started off as an NFT marketplace. And what they found was that through NFTs, you can have long-term relationships as brands with your customers, and you can deliver longer-term engagement with your customers by making sure that you are better understanding their motivations um, through an NFT. And so what they're focused on right now is advertising through NFT products with both in real life and digital one of a kind experiences. But they're also focused on how to lower the cost of acquisition and increase the lifetime value of customers at a time where Facebook and Google advertising costs are going up. And those costs are going up for two reasons. One, you have more people advertising. So the space that you have to advertise is more limited. And two, the um, new policies that Apple has put in place really restrict the way that Facebook and Google can best deliver ads. And so the promise of Sturdy is lower CAC, increase LTV, and deliver more delightful long-term experiences via advertising for customers. Perfect, thank you for that. And um, one of the ways it increases lowers the customer acquisition costs and increases lifetime value is by creating really exciting, fun, immersive experiences that connect you uh, really intimately with the brand. And I wanted to give you uh, a quick example uh, of Miller Lite doing this. And I think this is hilarious because um, I thought the uh, Clydesdales belonged to uh, Budweiser, but when it gets when it comes to the metaverse, you, you know, there's all things are fair game. So we're going to play a quick video here. Um, I'm going to optimize it for a video clip, um, and uh, fingers crossed that this works. Uh, and then Jay, I'd love for you to comment about um, how uh, Miller Lite and other brands are starting uh, to do this. So. Um, here goes. Uh, let me know it, it, just with a thumbs up if you guys are hearing this. Welcome to the first big game ad in the metaverse. How's it a big game ad if it's not even in the same universe as the big game? Well, relatable farmer, because we have a culturally relevant pop star and majestic horses. What do horses have to do with beer? America. And to appeal to the masses, we added puppies, avocados from another country, aliens, a Miller Lite robot, explosions, overly dramatic music, and more talking animals. Oh, this Miller Lite beer ocean tastes great! And in a not-so-subtle attempt to get press, we'll launch this ad exclusively in the metaverse. Wait, where are we? Well, it's just like reality, but with worse graphics. Oh yeah, don't forget an iconic tagline. All right, Jay, so there is our first glimpse at a metaverse ad. You want to talk a little bit about that campaign and, 
and some of the work that you've done with brands in the space. Oh, absolutely. So what was interesting about that campaign, I was peripherally involved at the uh, the planning stages of it. So I was privy to budget, you know, uh, set up all the various players, the the licensing and, and what have you. Um, what was really interesting about that is Miller Lite was just fed up with having to spend as much as they were going to on on Super Bowl ads and wanted a different and fresh way to sort of get get their message out, get something interesting out to the masses. It was completely a PR stunt. There were no KPIs associated with it. It was really a pure test and learn. They were willing to assign a certain dollar amount to this effort in order to create a space you know, that was much more like an experiential marketing execution in the metaverse than it was anything else. You know, there was a time and a moment where you could actually watch the ad itself. But what was really interesting about it, and I think what you're finding brands do successfully is this notion of creating a space where people can connect with one another by doing things that are either interesting, casual gaming, or social, or or the like. And this was one such experience. So they they partnered with the Central Land um, in their version of the metaverse, which I think is interesting to note too for some people on on uh, the the, uh, the the webinar here. They might not they might not think of they might think of the metaverse as being only a, a VR headset accessible thing, but you know, as Brett mentioned, through games like Roblox or Fortnite. Um, it is accessible through the television and Decentraland is not even on headsets at the moment. And it, it tends to be one of the more popular spots for metaverse landing and, and some of these marketing executions. Um, so what was interesting about the Miller Lite was truly, it was a, a physical space in the metaverse where people could gather. There was a bouncer at the door who was checking dates, of course, because they have, you know, they have to have their, their gateway. Um, once you got in, you could play darts, you could interact with people, you could play shuffleboard. Um, they hid a bunch of NFTs around. And I find that that's an, you know, another very powerful tool that's that um, marketers are using in the metaverse or these limited time freemiums, NFTs that they can collect. Sometimes they're wearables, sometimes they're just digital tchotchkes that you can sort of keep in your, in your object bag. Um, but they found you know, the level of engagement was through the roof. And, and as you might expect with some of these early sort of technologies, some of the tracking and, and analytics behind it aren't quite as formal as, as we, would, we would hope or we will expect to see in the future. Um, but I certainly think by visitation, time spent, you know, they found this to be a, a you know, a very good use of, of uh, you know, funds to, to try and underspend and get the type of splash around the Super Bowl that they were hoping for. And, and they largely activated their most engaged and, and most brand loyal audiences through their owned channels, which I think was an important way for, get, for them to get the type of visitation that they were hoping for. Um, you know, that barrier of entry for people who, you know, who think that it's going to only be in a headset. No, I don't, I don't own a headset or I don't have a gaming PC or what have you. Um, you know, they were really able to kind of break through and get, and get the sort of numbers that, that they had hoped uh, would would start this visitation. Are those numbers public? Do we have a sense of how many people actually engaged with this ad in the metaverse? So the this this was a, an extended campaign. It ran for a week. It wasn't just at the at the moment of the Super Bowl. Actually, those moment that that number was the lowest it was all week. Um, but yeah, they had they had in the hundreds of thousands of, of people wow. visiting. Yeah. So so I just want to point out, and I'm going to bring Brett up now to give a couple other very concrete examples that are going to blow your mind uh, about products and services that are today being marketed and bought and sold in the metaverse. Like, I just want to emphasize that this isn't theoretical. This is happening in many of you, hundreds of thousands of you, many of you on this uh, session today. In fact, if you could throw this in the chat, have any of you interacted with a brand either through an NFT or in the metaverse? Uh, please let us know uh, in the chat. We, I'm very curious of the hundred or so folks who are here, how many of you have have had a brand experience. Uh, and while uh, you guys are chatting about that, I'm gonna invite up Brett to give two really concrete examples, one about a product and one about a service in the metaverse. Sure thing. So, um, you know, the Miller Lite is a great example of how people can you know, engage with a brand um, and who, who might, you know, who sells a product that you're not gonna be able to consume in, in a digital way or in the metaverse, so to speak. Um, Nike though, you know, they make a product and you can consume this 
in, in the metaverse, so to speak. And uh, one of the things that you can have in the metaverse is an avatar, which is a digital representation of yourself, which I think everybody saw in that video. And you're probably familiar with this concept. Um, you can buy uh, Nike, uh, these, this case, Crypto Kicks. <laughs> and this is just one example of the many fashion brands that are creating um, product that you can actually purchase and, and wear in the metaverse. So there are some brands who are doing exclusive uh, releases of their, of their fashion. Um, there was actually a fashion week in the metaverse where 50 different brands all participated, um, you know, from, from uh, Dolce & Gabbana to um, H&M. I mean, and everybody's selling their products in this case as NFTs for people to, to purchase. So in this case, you can buy crypto kicks, you can uh, don them on your avatar. There is an app in the real world that you can use on your phone. Um, uh, then you point it at your, your actual shoes and it will do an augmented reality version of the shoes wrapped around, which is kind of cool too, because then you can kind of see them in the real world. But this is an example of, um, you know, a, a, Miller Lite's an example of a brand doing a experiential uh, thing in the metaverse, and Nike is doing a, a product or a, an object in the metaverse that they can that can uh, sell. So, yeah, just to dovetail on that, Brett. Um, you know what's interesting about this is that it's not them creating that the full experience, but really that it's like a almost like a sponsorship opportunity where they're able to kind of dip their toes in and do something that that has value more broadly than just creating one location in, in a metaverse that's that's doing a very specific thing. Yeah, yeah great point. Because in, in theory, as I mentioned at the top, once these meta worlds are interconnected and you can pass from one to the other, your avatar wearing these kicks could be going from one meta world to the next, wearing them over in all of them. Yeah. Right. Which is, you know, um, one of the frustrating. So my, any of you guys who have kids who are on Roblox uh, are, <laughs> oh, yeah. are already beginning to experience uh, what this world looks like. I, I have been giving my nine-year-old daughter uh, allowances uh, since she was five and every single dollar that she's been given has been spent on accessories in Roblox. Um, weird accessories like faces and hair and clothing and none of that clothing was branded, but it could have been. And so part of sort of what you're seeing is you could imagine that your kids in Roblox are gonna now spend in this case, 0.5 Ethereum, which is about $850 last time we checked to buy Nike shoes in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is an actual exchange that's actually selling crypto kicks for wearing on the metaverse and the price is $850. Um, I wanted you to also talk about the, so we're right now experiencing the US Open, Serena and Nadal are out, uh, my two favorites. Uh, Grey Goose created an activation. So Grey Goose is a product company, but they created an experiential uh, experience in the metaverse. You want to talk about this one, Brett? Yeah. So more aligned with, with the Miller Lite, um, you know, obviously can't sell alcohol in the metaverse, but can certainly sponsor events and, and create a pavilion. So what, what they actually did, and this is actually happening this week, it's, it's live. Um, they call it the, the, it's a meta lounge basically where, you, where they show you how to make the signature drink of the game. And uh -huh. During the US Open, they're doing limited edition giveaways of NFTs and products and things like that that you can collect and pick up while you're in the metaverse. So it gives you a reason to want to attend their meta lounge uh, in, in the metaverse. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously Bacardi is a, a local company here in Miami, but they're doing a ton of, of things in the metaverse it, from, from an experimentation standpoint. A, a lot of them are typically brand engagements that you can do that can be, you know, fun experiences so that you have a positive experience with their brands. That's great. Were there any, were there any other examples that you wanted to bring up, Brett, before uh, I wanted to move on to Chessie? Uh, I'd say let's get back to our experts. All right, Chessie. I, I was just gonna build off of what Brett was saying on the Bacardi one, because it's such a good example. It's not just about the experiences, one of the, one of the things that Bacardi did, which I think is is taking experiences, taking brand alignment, but also really showing high utility, is that they featured um, musical artists, put their songs into NFTs, and 
um, fractionalized the songs and gave parts of the songs away as NFTs to um, brand loyal um, customers for Bacardi. So here Bacardi was not only immersing you into a digital experience where you were getting an NFT, but you got the rights to a song, to a piece of a song from an emerging artist benefiting that artist also. And so it's not just about sort of this, these delightful immersive experiences where one day we will be able to put on a headset and go into, you know, an, another, um, another dimension um, and experience something in, in um, that is outside of our sort of reality. It's also about how you bring these moments into your reality. And so that's the part that I'm most excited about these moments where you bridge it, where you not only sort of put on a headset and go to the gray goose um, area, but where you're really able to take the gray goose area and bring it back into your reality um, like Bacardi is doing. So just to add another example. That's great. So I wanted to, you know, part of the goal here is to get the businesses uh, that are on the call and watching this afterwards um, to think about how could I apply this to my brand? I mean, ultimately, that's what this is really about, which is um, the metaverse is a marketing channel uh, like social media and other things. And so um, how do you make the most use of it uh, now uh, and how to think about approaching that? So um, I'm going to start with you, Jay. Um, the question is, how do you approach metaverse marketing? Um, there are at least three ways to think about it. One is direct monetization, which is Nike selling shoes, right? Collecting the, um, collecting the fee for that. Uh, second is more of a brand play to engage audiences to deepen the relationship. That's what Grey Goose and Miller are doing, um, is really it's about uh, branding. And then the third is uh, to upgrade the sales experience. In other words, when you're actually in the process, let's say of a B2B company uh, of selling to a prospect, you could actually, rather than using a Zoom, you could put on headsets and have a virtual meeting. So um, I'd love for you to address one or all three of those in terms of direct monetization, kind of more branding and experiential marketing, which I know is your specialization, and also even just sales experience and how you can upgrade that. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. And those are the three major buckets. I mean, it obviously ties back to your original KPIs and what you think is possible to to do in the metaverse. You know, if if you don't have a product that would have a ton of value, you know, obviously selling a pair of Nike kicks makes a ton of sense for them. But if you're selling something, you're selling uh, lawn care uh, accessories, that's not going to be the, maybe the greatest sort of experience. However, you know, there could be playful ways to do, um, you know, sort of a sales room, a virtual sales room type of a type of a experience with them. You know, I think for people trying to wrap their head around what ways to uh, to get involved in the metaverse, um, I wanted to even take a, a, a maybe a larger step out and and just try to get people comfortable with like the like what, it, what to do to even begin, you know, how to, how to play with it. Because a lot of people are maybe here to learn about it in the first place. Um, and then maybe they're looking for some concrete examples of, of how to do something. Um, but, you know, the, the first thing to do is curiosity, play, you know, play with the metaverse. You can go to decentraland.com. You can get in there. You can set up, you set up a wallet. You'll grab usernames too. That's important to make sure that your brand doesn't get co-opted by somebody else. Um, you know, have a look at what your competitors are doing, see how they can see how, see if there's anything that they're doing that makes sense for your businesses. Now you might intercept things like that. Um, one of the, the the lost arts is is stockpiling 3D assets. So once your moment comes to be involved in the metaverse, that you actually have a library of things to pull from, not only as potential NFT opportunities, but um, also to, to start to build some of these brand experiences. And then um, you know maybe look at maybe look at how your experiential marketing plans could potentially translate. You know if it's a brand play. You have a longer term sales cycle, um, you know, a brand play makes a lot of sense. We're trying to build a closer relationship with our customers. We can give them, you know, product reveals. We can give them a closer look of behind the scenes, manufacturing, things like that. I sort of bring them inside in ways that, that are completely new and different than they could ever experience them before. 
um, you have something that's that's a wearable product. It makes great sense to try, you know, try and see how direct monetization could be a play for you through sponsorships or getting involved with other partners, you know, that that have experiences where where transactions can be made. Um, you know, brand mashups that make sense that align with your own brand values. Um, and like you said, you know, I think the 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 sort of engagement component of it too, the try the try before you buy has been a little bit less successful in terms of my experience on the metaverse. Um, you know, I think all of those things will improve over time as as the hardware improves, as three assets get better, um, you know, as they start to push the technology a little bit further. Uh, but that's certainly, you know, not to say that it's out of the question. So hopefully that that got, you know, <laughs> a few answers in there for you against the against that original question. Yeah, that's great. So so just kind of to tease it out, um, I heard um, Jay mention four kind of initial steps. One is to log into Decentraland um, or another kind of uh, metaverse marketplace, set up a crypto wallet. Um, reserve your brand handles yes, um, and then look at what your competitors are doing. So, you know, back in web one, you made sure to get your domain name for your brand, you know, bizhack.com. Uh, and there was like a land grab at the beginning of web one for great domains. And then people made fortunes just selling those domains. Uh, that, that's kind of the land grab that's beginning to happen in, in the metaverse. Um, and so you need to be aware of that. If you're a larger company, you need to be reserving your brand handles now um, before someone else basically hijacks it from you. Right. Um, Chessie, that, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to just want to, I see in the chat, somebody said it sounds expensive. And then the good news is that it isn't actually, you know, it's free to, to reserve your handles. It's free to play with all these experiences. Um, you know, what does become expensive is if you intend to actually purchase uh, virtual real estate in one of these metaverses, you know, that that ranges in value, um, that could be, you know, that could be a bit but honestly, for the for the, uh, the Miller light, I think they spent $19,000 um, to own that in perpetuity, which doesn't seem so crazy for a brand. But obviously, if you're a smaller agency that that is a pretty reasonable chunk of change to have to commit. They are building a larger experience as well. But if you look at trade show booths and things like that, you know, I, I, I always try to go back to experiential marketing just, just for some at least, you know, level playing field um, numbers. Perfect. Um, I want to uh, bring it over to Chessie. You know, Chessie, could you sound a, a note of caution for us just about like, you know, Everybody's hyping this. People are losing a lot of money. Um, people who maybe shouldn't be playing in this space are, um, and it's hurting a lot of everyday people. And you, as part of the mayor's initiatives, are seeing this firsthand. Is there any notes of caution that, you know, how can we get started, but how can we not lose our shirts in the process? So I, I really appreciate that question. So I, I've been a crypto investor since. Um, um, was on one of the first major mainstream crypto projects that existed by a major corporation. I'm a crypto in believer, um, and yet I would encourage a lot, a lot of caution, especially when it comes to first time users. So one, anytime that you're thinking through an advertising campaign, you need to think about your holistic strategy and you need to make sure that it ladders into your overall goals and that you understand um, what money you're putting behind it um, and where you're gonna be maximizing the return and where your audience is. And so if you are selling shoes in real life um, and is, I would ask myself and you are trying to get new customers is the best place to go um, into the metaverse to get new customers. Only you will know that depending on your shoe brand, but you need to make sure that there is alignment there with your North Star um, and that there is a clear understanding of your KPIs, key performance indicators and how you're gonna reach your goals. Um, the second thing that I would say is that most of these um, platforms that we're discussing right now rely on cryptocurrencies as the method of payment. Um, and they do not offer what we call fiat on and off ramps that are very easy. So fiat currency is US tender. It's what we all use in the United States. And to get fiat in and out of um, 
of some of these um, platforms is a little bit difficult. So you have to be more knowledgeable about the crypto and the coins that you're using. The second thing to know is that once you're interacting with um, crypto, it's not just the cost of interacting. You just don't give um, you know, somebody a couple of crypto. There's a transaction cost associated with it. In fiat currency, that transaction cost exists. It's just obfuscated by Visa or MasterCard or your bank. You're paying that on the back end and you don't even realize it. In crypto, it's more transparent, but there is a transaction cost. Um, and then there are tax implications. So when you hold fiat on your books for more than 24 hours um, as a corporation, you are subject to um, capital gains, short-term capital gains, if you have gains. And that is something that I don't think most people appreciate that if right now we're in a in a bear market. So crypto unfortunately keeps, you know, it's it's more or less stable right now, but it has gone down from the traditional high. But if it were to go up, you would be seeing that you would have to pay um, short-term capital gains of 30% on your crypto assets that you hold for more than 24 hours as a company. So there are real serious tax implications here that you need to think about um, at, before you start dipping your toes. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not the right strategy for you. This could be the right strategy for you and taking all of Jay's great points and making sure that you are thinking about capturing your handle and making sure that you're thinking about the placement and your brand content might be the right thing to do given your audience, but it all goes back to where your audience is and then understanding the risks and opportunities with any new form of technology. Really well said, and thank you for that. Um, next session, we're gonna be talking about the financial, session two next Wednesday, the financial and legal implications of Web3. We're gonna go deeper into NFTs and cryptocurrencies. We're gonna also talk about restaurants that are using NFTs to sell desserts. In other words, you can create scarcity and hype up something in a way that could make people physically come to your restaurant and spend hundreds of dollars for something that they might have otherwise spent $30 on. And so, um, Jay, I see you're kind of perking up to this. Um, we want to be cautious, but we want to be opportunistic. Um, right. Can you talk about let's say you're in the initial part of a conversation with the brand that feels like metaverse uh, marketing is a way they wanna go. How do you find that right fit where you're balancing kind of risk and potential reward? I, you know, I go, I go, it's Francesca said it the best. You just have to go back to what are your, what are your key goals and KPIs? It, you know, I, I've worked in immersive technology for, for over a decade now and people would come to me all the time. I want a VR thing. I want an AR thing. And it's like, well, what are you actually trying to accomplish? And is that the actual, you know, the technology that you, you need to use in order to accomplish that? You know, I can't tell, I can't tell you how many times that I've talked people out of, out of doing something that they're telling me that they want. Um, but, you know, it does go back to that audience. Is your audience there? Are, are those the, you know, the, the early ones on the innovation curve you know, that you're trying to capture their imaginations and their, their ultimately their wallets, um, you know, are they in the metaverse? And, uh, you know, right now there's, there are a number of places that you can go to, to see who, you know, who is operating in the metaverse to see if that's, that's your, your perfect marketing um, target. But, um, you know, it is not for everybody. It is definitely not for everybody. And, and, you know, to be the first to something doesn't always mean that you're, you know, you're going to get, get the, the right sort of reaction or the right sort of KPIs out of it too. It just, every time somebody gets, somebody comes to me asking about, uh, you know, my advice or consultation on it, you know, I get, I just go laser focused on what is it that they're trying to do? You know, if they just want to light hundred thousand dollars on fire, that's great. We can do that. You know, if, if they're really trying to get some measurable results from, you know, from their execution, then let's talk about those. And then let's talk about a way that we can get you there. And I, I every time I, I start a project, that's really what, what I try to do and be laser focused on so that we, we also set up the right, the right ways in which to measure that campaign, that activation, or, you know, that long-term commitment. Because the other thing too, is that you want to, you want to buy real estate in the metaverse. You want to set up something. Now you've got to support that thing for the long term. It, it's going to be people and and you know money invested in it, and really you know just trying trying to make sure that people are 
opening their eyes to the the absolute longest term level of commitment to all of these things you know and is that supporting your long-term goals as well i think there are a number of great examples of companies that are doing that you know the right way but they also began this journey in an authentic way in brick and mortar and then translating those experiences to the metaverse so you know okay. intentional for them to you know to head there thank you chessie i mean I think that Jay is bringing up a really great point, which is the intentionality behind it. I, I would also say this, you are everyone on this call, every single person at this call is at the beginning of Web3. You are not late to the party. The party hasn't even started. No one even knows who the DJ is or who's. <laughs> you are very, very, very early to this party. And just the idea that you are finding out about this is gonna better position you in the future. And so I would start playing with all of the platforms. I would see what works for you and what doesn't work for you, what resonates for you and doesn't resonate for you. This is going to be a huge time investment because, you know, when I, when I think about Meta, uh, Facebook, and when I started, we did not have, I started at, at Facebook nine years ago. We did not have one pagers on the website for how you set up a Facebook business account. They didn't exist. You were on your own. It was the platform that was just sort of, you know, we're making this easy platform and everyone get on it. It's never that easy. Now Facebook has a one pager to say, step one is you put in your name. Step two is you go here. Step three is step four is. So where we are right now is even before nine years ago at Facebook, but there is no one pager for how you get on. And so it's gonna require a lot of time and energy to get on these platforms, which I totally encourage you to invest in because it's awesome, right? Who doesn't like to be first? But just take the time to learn it. There is absolutely no rush. And as you learn it, you're gonna perfect your strategy and that's gonna be incredible and it's gonna pay off huge dividends in the end. I just wanted to give a plug to the work that Brett and I are doing, which is we're gonna create a one pager for you, uh, a takeaway. <laughs> which is just a summary of some of the best advice that we're getting. Uh, it's not a definitive one and it's gonna change with time, but we will have a one pager. Um, Chamara Napoleon asked a great question, which really gets to the heart of marketing on the metaverse, which is, are we able to know how many people locally are in the metaverse for marketing purposes? Um, I'll open that up either to you, Jay or Chessie, if you know the answer to that. Um, living adjacent to New York City, there are bi local businesses that are participating in the metaverse. Um, but you know, I, I don't, I don't think that I'm seeing scale with small businesses necessarily. Um, you know, I, I, it's mainly the largest players that are currently, in, you know, in the metaverse as far as I'm seeing. Yeah, Chessie. I mean, we're seeing the same thing. Companies like Sturdy are now an Accenture preferred vendor, so you're going to start seeing better economics. Um, and so I, I think that we'll see more medium-sized businesses join the metaverse. But you're really talking about, if you're talking about small businesses, and now we're talking about companies that have less than 25 employees or small or medium-sized businesses that have less than 250 employees, you're talking about pretty tight margins and pretty tight at a moment in time where marketing across the board is going up. And so... It, that's where it because that's one of the reasons that I think that we're not seeing more is just there's a, a a limited amount of capital to put into this area. I expect over the next five years that we'll really see a dynamic shift, and I also think that we're going to see companies like Meta, like Google, like Amazon, like Apple join the metaverse. And these companies know how to bring people to new products. That is the thing companies know how to do better than anyone else. They can get a flywheel started, and they can make sure that people are using it. And so I think that we'll find more easier on-ramps than the on-ramps that we're finding right now. Yeah, I'll give you two kind of lay ways to approach this. Number one, you should ask your customers, like, are you on the metaverse? In which, you know, games are you playing? Do you play Fortnite? Do you play Roblox? Um, you know, and, and then I would then go to those places or maybe you're already there. Maybe you even met them there um, and, and just be a user and just kind of hang out and check it out and learn it. So for instance, you know, if I were in a company that was catering to teenagers, I would be on Fortnite. I would be in Roblox. I think you'd be crazy not to be. Um, a great, here's a great web two example of this. 
years ago, we worked with a dance company in Doral. And there was a company, a social media emerging company called Musical.ly, where all the girls who were in the classes were in Musical.ly having tons of fun. Well, guess who bought Musical.ly? TikTok. He has been in TikTok before TikTok was TikTok. And the reason why is because he asked his girls, where do you hang out? So you got to learn your customer. And if they're hanging out on a platform, it's your job to learn it. And that would be a really easy starting point um, for, for, for how to do some audience discovery and to really understand if this is a platform. And, and by the way, you have a lot of choices about how you market. If you go on this platform and you're loving it and you're enjoying it, then it's probably a good place to market as well. If your audience is there and you love it and you can go there in an authentic and transparent and vulnerable way, because that's what works, and you can be authentic in that space, then you're going to find success. You'll find a path to success. And you will be not only an early adopter, but one who's there for the right reasons. Um, Sabine yeah. DeSource asked, the metaverse isn't regulated yet. Can someone pioneer the safety of the metaverse or Web3? Love that question. Let's ask it in session two on the financial and legal frameworks of Web3. So great question, wrong session. Um, what budget ranges are recommended to participate? Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to actually my the the one thing I was going to pick up on was something that you said and then Francesca shook shook a uh, shook a note loose in my brain, which is, you know, back in the day web 1.0, you know, if you look to build a website, a transactional website, you were in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? You know, nowadays you can set up a Squarespace page for $25 a month, you know, and, and you could do millions of dollars in revenue off that, off that $25 a month. Right. We are, we are right at that very stage too, where if, if brands are looking to get involved in the metaverse, a limited number of, of companies building these experiences, limited number of tool sets, you know, there's no such thing as like a WordPress engine for, for, you know, a metaverse and meta is and actually, the, you know, there's no off the shelf tools really. Yeah, correct. So, you know, it's a combination of a lot of custom work and especially you start talking about 3D, that third dimension adds just zeros to, to budgets. Um, but, you know, once somebody will crack the nut of creating, you know, a, a more entry level tool set, and that's when you're going to start to see these small, medium sized businesses truly able to participate in a much more significant way barring all of the legal and financial, you know, crypto components that, uh, that Francesco was mentioning earlier, but, um, you know, budgets could be in the, the low hundreds of thousands of dollars, but, but I think that that's kind of, if you're building an immersive experience, I think that that's, that's where you're at. I, I, I want to say one thing on the, the legal and regulation, because I, I think it's super important. I know that there's going to be a whole topic about it, so I'll just be super quick. Um, with all new technologies, regulation lags, you are seeing significant regulation that is expected this year around cryptocurrencies. And so I wouldn't think about this as an unregulated space. There are already guardrails, but again, it's just understanding what those guardrails are because they're different to traditional financial guardrails. Um, but this is not, the metaverse is no longer about you know, you know, five years ago when we started talking about this, the metaverse was a place where all the where people had the most fun and did the worst things on the internet. That's <laughs> where we are anymore um, because there have been significant improvements to make the metaverse like Roblox a safe, a, 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 an increasingly safe space for a mass audience, which is where everyone wants us to go. Everyone wants us to be a mass audience play. And in order for this to be a mass audience play, it has to be increasingly safer and safer. Yeah. And you also do see brands being responsible for that too. Miller Lite was told by Decentraland that they needed the, you know, the, the age gateway in order to have people come into their experiences, which is a standard practice on, you know, on the regular web. So, you know, you, you are seeing some level of responsibility in corporate stewardship to, to try and make sure that that's, you know, adhered to. Yeah. And Dan, I just want to comment too, like, you know, um, you had said if you're targeting, I don't know, 15 to 17 year olds hop on Roblox, but I, I you know, I don't want to uh, pigeonhole or stereotype. So Gucci, 
who has the famous Gucci Gardens in Italy, recreated the Gucci Gardens in the metaverse using Roblox. I, I, is that their target audience or is that the platform, the meta world that they decided to execute on? There are many, um, you know, I see some questions about, you know, where to get started. There are some that are more business friendly, that are more business-like, that are some that are more game-like and more childlike. And, and then if you look at what Facebook is doing in the horizon worlds, you know, I think it, it maybe is a little bit in between, right? It, it has the fun gamey part, but it also could be used for business, right? So I think that there are so many platforms and meta worlds out there right now that, and there's only going to be more. You need to find the one that maybe gels with your brand or your brand aesthetic, your brand style, your brand, you know, messaging, your brand culture, right? And, and uh, you don't have to say, I have to go to this one or that one necessarily, because over time, they're going to get interconnected, Right. And, and, you know, you want to find the one that maybe is the best fit for you. Yeah, that's a great example. I, I actually joined Facebook when I was a student at Princeton and it was only open uh, to Ivy League schools. And then, of course, Facebook became Facebook, your grandpa's social media platform. <laughs> so the, the, the point is that, you know, a platform grows and evolves and its audience shifts and changes with time. Um, so I, I, I love that. You know, uh, J.D. Hanau uh, asked, kind of what is the starting budget for this? Um, and Gasoline DeSource asked, what is the cost to create your platform for the metaverse and must you know coding? So um, could you just, we're gonna do like a quick lightning round to get through some of these questions. Uh, I wanna give a couple more fun, concrete examples of actual metaverse campaigns. And then uh, I'm gonna, Jackie has a question that we'll wrap up the Q and A with. Um, we're going to run obviously a little past uh, our 1.30 stop time, uh, but uh, folks are engaged and, and I want to keep going and take advantage of these great experts. So um, Chessy, Jay, Brett, um, throw out just really quickly a line or two, what would be kind of a, a, a budget that you probably need to have available to really make a serious uh, marketing or advertising play in the metaverse? I'll start with you, Jay. So I think if we're talking about a sponsorship opportunity, you're probably low tens of thousands of dollars, you know, depending upon who you're aligning with and what need, what sort of creative work, content work needs to be done. Um, I think if you are actually attempting to build your own space, your own experience in the metaverse, I think we're talking in the, you know, the hundred plus thousand dollar range um, to truly do something. And then again, I don't want that point to be left out uh, that I mentioned earlier about the long-term sustainment. You know, Miller Lite did had theirs for one week where they had monitoring, um, you know, people on people in their experience monitoring what was happening so that they could police a little bit. You know, there are some behind the scenes costs, ongoing costs. Um, I think if you do anything north of that, it's really just, you know, more about interactions, completely custom work, um, custom brand experiences, then you're, you know, in the, the two fifty to three hundred thousand dollar range, likely. Great. Um, so, and, and tens of and, thousands for a sponsorship to hundreds of thousands to build your own custom experience. Great. Yeah. So, the, the just to ground us again in sort of definitions, the metaverse starts from JPEGs and goes all the way to interact <laughs> headphones. True. I mean, headsets, incredible with the headphones. So. If you start all the way at the JPEG section, right, where basically you're talking about you're creating a QR code on the blockchain. Sorry to all my NFT friends that will not like it described that way. Um, and then a third party platform, and you're looking in the low thousands. If you go all the way to gaming and headsets and immersive world, and I'm going to go into the, you know, um, I don't know, into a a specific um, ambiance, and I'm walking into somebody's store, and I can purchase things. Then you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's it you can get you can build what you want. Again, I think that if 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 you have one takeaway, there are two takeaways that I would have from this conversation. One of them from is from Dan. One of them is from Jay. From Dan, it's talk to your customers, understand what they want. And from Jay is understand what your budget is and what your KPIs are. And so you can build, you can back your way into any budget that you want to back your way into, but you're not going to get everything that you want depending on your budget. Brett, thank you, Chessie. Uh, no, I mean, I think those are, those are great answers. Um, so, you know, if you start with um, objects, Sort of like Chessie was saying, you could start with a QR code or like Nike's building shoes, but they're they're selling them. So they're actually what they're investing, you know, selling them to make money. 
I want to make, there's a lot of questions about metaverses and meta worlds. I, I, I put in a, co a comment in one of the questions, like think of a, a meta land or a meta place or a meta world just as like, as like a website. There's going to be hosting costs for your website, right? That hosting cost is on a meta verse platform. Like some of them are free right now. You can host on, on, you know, some of these platforms for free, but there is going to be a cost to set that up, you know, and, and budgetarily, I think, Chessie made a really good point. Like, do you have existing 360 degree photos? You can absolutely use those in a headset right now or 360 degree videos. You can use those right now. So if you have some existing assets, you know, go for it because let's start there and learn. Don't invest a huge amount of money and, until you've tested something small and learned from it. Did it work? Was the customer there? They like this. They didn't like that. They like this thing. I didn't think they'd like, but that, you know, or guess what? Everyone really thought this little thing was the cool, right? So I would say test with where, start small, test with, with what you can to get started. Yeah, this is the Wendyverse, Dan. Um, this was super fun. You know, this one's built on Facebook's uh, Horizon Worlds platform. Um, you know, you can't buy, uh, you know, Wendy's in the metaverse, but if there is a scavenger hunt, and if you find six things, you get a coupon for six chicken nuggets at a real life Wendy's, right? So there's a payoff to exploring their meta world, which is fun. They also have this really fun game, you know, like the, the shuffleboard game where you, you skid the metal pucks down the, like the sawdust thing, but they're hamburgers and you're sliding them down and, and there's a leaderboard and your name shows up on the leaderboard against other people around that are playing. And so uh, this is just a fun place to explore for sure. And, you know, just to your point, uh, you know, Wendy's didn't invent a new logo. Uh, you know, they were using some existing assets and populating it in this virtual world. And so, you know, one of those first steps we're recommending is just inventory any 3D graphics you have, any uh, assets you have, and, and you could potentially leverage them if you wanted to kind of try to create an experience. Uh, here's another example from Tommy. Yeah, and I mentioned at the top of the call, the, you know, the Fashion Week, Tommy Hilfiger, over 50 brands participated in the Metaverse Fashion Week, MVFW, which was on, um, which was on Decentraland, you know, um, Estee Lauder, Forever 21, a lot of others. Um, and so it was, it helped bring people to it because it was an event. It wasn't just one brand launching. And so um, being a quote unquote storefront or participating in a larger group Right. So if there's a, a industry group that's doing something and you want to have a booth in it, that might be a way, way less expensive, easier way to put your toe in and test than kind of building your own. In this case, a bunch of brands came in and they got together and did a fashion week. So they're able to really, you know, do a lot with a little, uh, so to speak. So another good example here. Yeah. And I'm starting to kind of hear a little bit of a theme. Um, these seem to be national brands, well-known brands uh, in fashion, uh, alcohol. Uh, restaurants, I know we're seeing some examples of um, th th those that are really about like establishing a brand lifestyle and experience. Um, and then when it comes to fashion, you can actually sell fashion in, in, a, in a meta world. Um, and so um, th those are just some of the areas uh, the, the, that companies that we're hearing are starting to like really explore. Eventually, this will become something we all do, you know, just like you know, Twitter started out with, uh, you know, a lot of journalists and politicians and now has become a pretty ubiquitous platform. You know, the platforms will evolve and become more general as, as more people do it. Just wanted to quickly wrap up with a few uh, last questions and then hand it to Jackie for hers. Um, Ariel asked, any suggestions regarding how to get traffic data on each metaverse, depending on location, network, uh, neighborhood? One of the things that we wanted to make sure, Ariel, you heard, is that the analytics are really, really early days. And so measuring success and having like really clear KPIs, which we've gotten really used to in web one and web two, um, my understanding, unless anyone wanted to disagree, is we're not there yet. Um, and so um, you're gonna have to be kind of patient uh, with the analytics because it hasn't really caught up. Uh, I will say, yeah, I will say real quick one one thing about that is that um, anything is possible, of course, but you might end up, you know, having custom work being done in order to, to truly capture that funnel or that that KPI that you're looking for. It's there's no such thing as Google Analytics on, you know, that's going to by by putting in tiny code is going to capture everything that you might want. So yeah, I mean, early but, days. you know, did you sell your your sh Nike shoe? Yes or no? That's an analytic. That's pretty clear. <laughs> 
Um, you know, did people engage uh, in your metaverse experience? How many and for how long? Those metrics are available. I'm not sure, sure you're going to get like detailed uh, geographic or biographical data on each of those participants like we've gotten used to in social media. But frankly, we're losing that soon as well. Um, <laughs> Angela H H H uh, Hisianos asked, uh, this is a great question to wrap up with before I bring Jackie on. Um, are there any classes, groups, or ways where we can learn metaverse for dummies? There are great um, resources in my, I'm, I'm sure that there are in New York, I'll speak to the ones in, in Miami. Um, there's for, um, for women, there's a group called Web3 Equity. Um, it's for women and um, BIPOC, and it focuses on making sure that there is equity in Web3. Um, there are classes that are at Miami-Dade College that are absolutely fantastic. Um, there are opportunities online from a different sources. And then I would say Twitter is the best place to learn. Um, and so if you start following people on Twitter, um, Dan, Brett, maybe we can send a few names to suggest just to make sure that they follow them. But that's the place where everyone is learning. As we said earlier, you're not, you're very early to the party. There are very, very, very few people that know more about Web3 than you do right now. And so you be at the really at a perfect point. And it's all about what you can learn. And I would really highly encourage Twitter. Yeah, I would share, I would share that same sentiment here. There, you know, there are a lot of the AR VR organizations uh, within New York City have have gone on to include metaverse uh, and blockchain technologies, um, you know, into the the sort of ongoing series. But um, you're rarely learning more than than you can learn online at this point. Perfect. Um, Jay, Tessie, we would love your suggestions, and we're going to definitely incorporate that in the one pager. Uh, with your, you know, comprehensive guide to the metaverse and Web three. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but we definitely would love to include, you know, the Twitter handles, um, folks who are going to give you kind of a clear eyed view, not hype you or try to sell you on something that's like half baked. Um, so we have some, tr we'll have some trusted resources for you guys in that takeaway at the end of these four sessions. So Jackie, you had a great question for Jay and Chessie, and then we'll go into our Q&A. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll kick this around to anybody who can jump in here. Um, I'm hearing, and first of all, this has been fantastic. All of you have been fabulous. So thank you. Learned a ton. Um, I've been hearing a lot about experiences of brands that are presenting themselves in a very traditional way, which is a very brand to consumer. You know, of course, I've heard over and over again, know your consumer, know what your strategy is, but really wanted to find out. And especially in light of, of um, you know, what we're hearing about diversity and inclusion, right? Rapidly changing demos all across the United States, Miami, one of the tech hubs now, right? Um, any brands out there collaborating with content creators, uh, namely, you know, of different groups that have done some really innovative things in the Met, the Meta Universe space. Do you know of any brands that have really, um, really leaned in into the whole trend of inclusiveness, right? And use it to innovate and do something creative. Um, I think Francesca, that great example from Bacardi, you know, using music from um, from artists, you know, up and coming artists. Uh, I personally don't think I have like a really good example to share with you. Um, you know, I do find that online interactions tend to be um, inclusive in general when you don't know exactly who's behind an avatar. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know of any big brands that are that are doing anything that that I would specifically say that their first intent was behind inclusion. Uh, but that's certainly an interesting space to to play. Yeah. I, I, um, you know, I, it's a really interesting question. The brand affiliation that we are seeing with a lot of the, um, a lot of pop stars and music stars and musicians that are getting into the space could be, you could look at that as that's more inclusive, but really what, what I'm seeing more than anything is that it's about trying to connect with younger audiences. Um, by definition, those audiences are more diverse. Uh, that they're, 
it's the second time that I'm going to say this backing their way into it. So I, I don't mean to, yeah, you know, uh, suggest that they're not being thoughtful about it, but I don't think that it's forefront. It's more about how you engage with sort of a, a younger audience that is more likely to be using these new products, but that is by definition younger. What, what I am seeing though, which I think is interesting is um, I'm seeing people experiment a lot and yeah. because we don't know, everyone is throwing spaghetti at the wall and we don't know what sticks. I'm seeing much more creative campaigns and much and campaigns that are much more targeted at smaller groups. And that by definition, I think is more inclusive because you're not trying to have one message that appeals to everyone. You are saying, I understand that there are multiple groups here and I wanna have multiple messages that appeal to multiple people. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I see also Jennifer has a great point in the chat as well around the intentionality and the thoughtfulness. I think that's that's awesome. The other thing too is that um, on the flip side um, for different groups, I think that the metaverse present, prevents, uh, no, uh, presents a really incredible opportunity to be a part of the creation of it as far as the creation of content, the creation of new business models, the creation of new structures, um, it's a great opportunity to be involved. And so just kind of throwing it out there as like a lot of the folks from this webinar are probably coming from uh, the new tech hubs just spun off, you know, like Miami, New York, DC. Um, we've seen a, a movement away from um, just Silicon Valley as being the center of this stuff. Yeah, well, I wanted to um, just remind you guys, um, you're going to get a recording of this session on our YouTube channels, both BizHacks and Star Marks, within the next couple of days. Uh, please feel free, if you want to watch that Miller Lite uh, ad again, to watch there. Uh, we'll be sending a summary of our key takeaways and resources uh, via email at the end of all this. Uh, you'll automatically be enrolled in the upcoming three masterclass sessions, and there's the link if you want to invite others to join. You can see the incredible quality that we're bringing to the table. Next week, we're talking about the financial and legal implications of Web3 for business with Brett Malinowski and Kim Pryor. Kim is actually the author, co-author of a, the first textbook in blockchain law uh, and based here in Miami. So we're incredibly lucky to have her. Then on 921, we're gonna talk about audience uh, employee engagement and recruiting. And on 928, some incredible case studies of how to do business using Web3. Actually, uh, I wanted go to- back. Can you go back one slide? So uh, Jackie, one of your uh, questions about this, uh, the 921 session, Angela Anthony, her company Scoutable is doing a f a f some amazing things with using the metaverse for recruitment and where uh, people can create their own avatars and then they're conducting their uh, interviews using their avatars, which immediately removes all bias from the interviewing process. And I think this is going to be a fascinating uh, session on 921. Perfect. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. Um, so Jackie, head of strategic partnerships, diversity, inclusion, and belonging at LinkedIn. And I, I promised you at the, the beginning, um, we all have heard of DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am really interested in the use of the word belonging. So maybe we could start there uh, and just ask you about that. Uh, Chessy and Jay, thank you guys. We'd welcome you to stay on, uh, or if you need to go, no worries. But we really appreciate your gift of your time and expertise, and we're very grateful for you. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for your work uh, in this space and supporting brands and supporting small businesses, Chessy in, so in South Florida. So, so Jackie, belonging, talk to us. Yeah, no, definitely. And thanks for having me. Um, uh, belonging at LinkedIn, we uh, talk about diversity as being diversity, um, inclusion, and belonging. And belonging is all about, um, you know, having an environment that you actually truly feel that you belong. Um, you know, diversity, um, when, you, when you look at... Uh, you know, you look at, it's all about the environment itself, right? That's why you really, uh, it's one you could have, you can be represented in an atmosphere, right? In an environment, but what does it really look like to really feel that your uh, contributions are truly valued and you are, um, you are seen as an innovator, right? That's where, that's where the true magic occurs uh, when you're, when you could do that. And you could see that in the space too, like, you know, when we were having the discussion about um, uh, Web 3.0, you 
you know, imagine the innovation that will truly occur when like everyone feels like they can contribute. And that's to me, um, some of the, the key points coming out of uh, the transition to this technology. That's great. Would you talk to us, Jackie, about some of your work on diversity, inclusion, and belonging in the context of LinkedIn? And, and, and what exactly does that mean uh, for you and for the company? Yeah, no. Um, it's at LinkedIn, um, Dibs, uh, diversity, inclusion, and belonging is actually one of our uh, very important to the company. Talent is our number one priority. And um, you know, that covers many things, right? Uh, the structure of that, it's from anywhere from how we recruit inclusion recruiting all the way to, uh, to creating an environment of belonging for all, you know, we have 10 plus ERGs from all of our employees to make sure that they feel that they're in an environment. Um, and then also to make sure everyone's growing and developing. And to all the business leaders listening to this, I mean, really, you know, it, when you think about DEI, it covers all of that, I'm sure. Uh, the Nella is is very um, attuned to this, and and so that's what we that's how we think about it, as well as what happens on the network itself. Perfect. And do you feel like the, like what are some concrete things that LinkedIn is trying to do to to make it a more inclusive space? I you know I, I actually have um, you know. I haven't actually really thought about LinkedIn from a diversity and equity and inclusion perspective, meaning I'm not sure if I really know the answer of, you know, do BIPOC communities, do women feel safe there? Um, and so uh, I'd love for you to, to talk about like where maybe some of the opportunities are. Um, I will say this, yes. I feel like LinkedIn is a safer space than Facebook. And I th there are very conscious things that, LinkedIn, and then now it's corporate owner Microsoft has done to restrict the virality of content to make it safer. And so I really applaud you and Microsoft, your owners, for foregoing engagement, views, money in order to create a better and safer space, you know, for engagement. You know, I do have to say, right, because I'm not like here to pitch LinkedIn, that it is getting a little bit of, you know, a lot of sales, incoming sales uh, in mails, um, you know, but but by and large, I don't go into LinkedIn, worry about what I'm going to see or feel sort of b b besieged or under attack from advertisements and crazies like I sometimes do on some of the other platforms. So I feel like LinkedIn uh, ha has has done a good job creating a, a professional um, workplace for us, but obviously there are challenges and, and work to be done. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about wh where do you think the next step is gonna be in making it even more inclusive, even more um, uh, you know, safe? No, I appreciate that. I mean, our team has uh, worked very hard to make sure that the platform is, um, is a professional environment meaning that everyone is respectful um, in terms of you know, expressing views, but also it's a constructive environment, right? And um, we've done a lot to make sure that our standards are in place to, to do that. And glad that you've recognized that. And um, uh, we've been recognized as uh, you know, one of the trusted platforms. So really appreciate you saying that, right? As far as making sure it's more inclusive, um, I'll actually, you know, talk more about my specific role. Um, my job is uh, I run strategic partnerships for our global diversity and inclusion team, right? So we have about 50 partners across the network. In fact, several of them are involved in a lot of the work that we do in the metaverse, like Blavity, for instance, um, is the largest um, black tech uh, company globally, media company globally, and they've done a lot of work as far as setting up um, metaverses for that community. So we do a lot of work with them. Another is LTX Quest. So organizations uh, such as LTX Quest are very large communities that uh, cater to the Latinx population. And um, so in my uh, job, what I do is I partner with like the largest, most influential groups uh, just to make sure that they're more 
diverse and inclusive voices on the platform. We launched something called Black Voices uh, a few years ago, and it's up to about 8 million LinkedIn members are following that. Um, my uh, Some of the partners that I used uh, have partnered with, um, the followerships is up to 1.5 million and growing um, and grew tremendously over the last couple of years. So um, we do a lot as far as, you know, just cultivating new influencers, uh, both women, um, Black, Latino, LGBT audiences. So a lot of that is happening right now. You had asked the question earlier about creators and thought leaders. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me, I recall, and, and just so everybody knows, we'll wrap up in four minutes, but I, I just want to squeeze the juice out of this as much as possible, because it's amazing to have you guys here. Um, I remember that you were doing some initiatives to like unearth thought leaders and give them training and a platform to be louder and noisier about their thought leadership. Um, I, I'm very fuzzy though on the details. Is that still a program you guys are running? Is that yeah. something that maybe some people who are still here, uh, more than two thirds of the folks who have stayed to the end uh, are still here could potentially apply to? Is there any anything you can share about that as we wrap up? Yeah, look up for our creators program. That's what you're uh, referring to, right? So we are um, running progr a program. We uh, kicked off the second cohort just recently. But basically, we're running uh, programs which really encourage our members to get more active on the platform, to create content, really guide them in how to do that, how to build audiences, how to engage people through video, um, new features that we have. So that's what you're so definitely look out for um, those programs as they're kicked off uh, on a pretty regular basis. So that's the LinkedIn Creator Accelerator program, a six-week yeah, program. Exactly. exactly. Amazing. Well, Jackie, is there anything else you wanted to share before we wrap up? Um, just a really great um, opportunity to be here on the on the call today. I think um, one of the big insights that I've had about this whole Web point three and how it um, appeals to different audiences is that. A lot of the cities, especially post pandemic, we've just seen, um, you know, just the, the growth, incredible growth in different centers in, within the US, right? Which happen to be diverse um, cities with a lot of diversity Miami, New York, DC, you know, Houston, just different parts of the country, Austin. Um, that also have been creating a lot of tech jobs, right? And it's parallel to what's happening as far as like the web 3.0 where things are more decentralized. There's more of a, a focus on community, um, a more focus on, you know, increase in ownership. So I'm just seeing a really great opportunity um, in the sea change here to for, for different groups to get involved and to participate in the creation of the future. So. Just wanted to, to talk about that. Um, just a real life example, real world example, how it exists right now. And it's just an incredible opportunity. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we've learned with BizHack is one of the best things you can do from a DEI perspective is partner with the right organizations um, and have them provide their access to their networks and their credibility so that that's a way to create a sense of safety. So um, thank you so much, uh, Jackie, Jay, Brett, phenomenal job. Uh, Tiffany, thank you as always. Um, and we'll see uh, all of you guys in one week uh, at 1230 on next Wednesday to talk about financial and legal of Web3. Take care, everybody.